Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Barard. I'm your host, Michelle Barard, founder and CEO of Urban Book Editor, and I'm really happy to share this hour with you, where we examine all those places where spirit meets life and the joys and challenges that may bring. Now, you guys know I like to start by thanking Ms. Beverly Black and Tribe Family Channel for helping me create this space for us. Tribe Family Channel is home to an assortment of thought-provoking shows that explore life, spirit, business, and culture, including The Woman at the Well, hosted by Ms. Beverly Black herself. Somewhere in the Middle was born on Tribe Family Channel. And though we have grown onto our own platform, we are ever grateful and loyal to our roots. To paraphrase an African proverb, we are here only because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Now, our last show was a replay of an interview with Denise Bampo, founder of BeWellBeSwell.com, which provides resources, tools, and support to those caring for loved ones. You can learn more about Denise at her website, and you can connect with her on social media. If you missed it, make sure you listen to the replay. You can find our complete show archives, including the February 12th show at the Somewhere in the Middle Podcast.com. I also want to shout out Bruce George of the Genius is Common movement, which encourages all of us to embrace our inner genius and share it with the world. This is a really important message, and I hope that you will share it with the youth. But it's not just for the kids. I mean, sometimes we adults need to be reminded that the world needs our genius. Learn more about the Genius is Common movement at www.geniusiscommon.com. Now, you guys know that we are taking a little bit of time off right now, so we've got another great replay for you. I'd like you to enjoy this interview with financial guru, Kendall Weaver. Now, I'm really pleased to introduce tonight's guest, my friend, my younger sister, if you will, Kendall Weaver. Kendall Weaver grew up in Decatur, Georgia, which is on the east side of Metro Atlanta, but she hails from the Windy City, which is why she considers herself to be a tough-skinned, bittersweet Georgia peach. Kendall runs a financial consulting firm located in the heart of Atlanta that focuses on empowering women and minorities through financial education and the implementation of sound financial strategies. And this is a pretty big deal considering that Kendall's family was poor and she became a teen mom by the age of 17. The situation forced Kendall to grow up quickly so she could take care of her new family, but she soon discovered that she wasn't cut out for the corporate world. After being fired from just about every job she'd ever worked, and after much coaxing by a mentor, she decided to pursue a career in finance. Now she runs offices for one of the largest financial marketing firms in North America and leads a team of multicultural boss ladies. Kendall is no stranger to the mental toughness and perseverance required to tackle challenging times. After struggling with homelessness, poverty, teen pregnancy, and two divorces, Kendall has mastered the art of manifesting while making it look easy. In addition, Kendall gives back to her community and is currently working on a project to mentor teen mothers through business and entrepreneurship skills. All right, so I would like to welcome Kendall Weaver to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Barard. Thank you, Kendall, for being on the show. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. I'm so excited. Well, you know, I'm excited because, well, you and I met, how long ago did we meet? Two, three yeah, it's probably been about two and a half years. Maybe. Yeah, something I don't like know. that. Yeah, but it feels like I've known you for all of my life, and I love those. Those are like the perfect relationships. I know, and we've talked about so many things, and I really look forward to sharing some of those things here in the air because I think you are an incredibly interesting person in your own rights, and you know that this show is about people's journeys, right? Absolutely. I'm so excited. You have no idea. And um, I love your voice. I, you know, I had to say that. <laughs> You're so sweet. Thank you. That's a special You're welcome. Yay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask you, you know, I start with two, two questions at the beginning of each show. And so I'm going to ask you my two questions and we're going to go from there. You ready? Okay. I guess I have to be. Yes, I'm ready. All right. Miss Kendall Weaver, yes, who are you, and how did you become who you are today? I am a dynamic creator, and I don't. I just feel like I provide light. I shed light. I am light, seriously, to 
anyone that is around me, you know, um, how did I get to where I am today? <laughs> I think you can't become light until you go through a lot of darkness. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you don't, you know what, you do not even appreciate the light until you have gone through a lot of darkness. And, um, and so I have come to appreciate so much. I think um, my family, if I can go back a little bit, my family is from uh, the south side of Chicago. And I usually say we're broke, begats broke, begats broke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it is just a bunch of brokenness. Um, and I just remember my family uh, being in the projects growing up. And then my mother, she moved us. Um, she wanted so much I'm so grateful for my mom. You know, she just always had a vision for us and she wanted to, um, to have a better life for us. And so she moved us, um, into the suburbs, you know, from Chicago. I was, mm-hmm. I believe it was, um, Bolingbrook is what the, the suburbs would call at that time. And just to get us away from all the crime, cause Chicago was really bad. Like I said, we were in the projects when I was younger and, you know, we were out there for a little bit and then would you have it? Um, would you know, my cousin got murdered out there, my younger cousin, um, and that just shook our whole family. She was like 12. She got raped and murdered. Mm -hmm. Um, It was terrible. And, you know, once again, darkness. Um, My dad had gotten into drugs really bad, alcoholism. And the crazy thing about it is you kind of run and you, and to escape those things, you know, and um, it just was following us. Mm -hmm. It it just seemed like, you know, you, you, I think the saying is like, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> and right. so, we, you know, we were taking that stuff with us. And so um, that was hard. We moved back into the city and my mom just kept saying she wanted better. She wanted better. She had grown up around black people, you know, and that poverty all her life, that, that broke mentality. It's not even just black. It's just a broke mentality. Mm-hmm. And she felt like she wanted something um, greater and she wanted to leave Chicago. Everybody told her she was crazy, Michelle. They, they, you know, yeah. every, the family spoke against her. I don't know if you've ever, well, you've definitely made that move where people are like, oh, you'll be back. Oh, yeah. You know, anything big that you want to do in your life. And so my mom was a pioneer for me. Um, and I didn't notice it. It's so crazy now that I'm an adult. And I can appreciate all the moves and the sacrifices um, that she made. She was like my age, you know, now, you know, making right. these big power moves. And I didn't, I didn't know with two kids. And, um, she kind of picked a different, a couple of different places and uh, Atlanta was the place that she settled upon right up before the Olympics. And she saw like a church on TV, like a mega church. And she wanted to move to Atlanta for that church to be a part of that because she felt like God was telling her to go there. Would you have, would you know that that church actually became such a staple in my life? Not one, but two of my husbands came from that church. Okay. Wow. Hallelujah. I graduated from the school, you know, that uh, the church had. I got a scholarship to attend the the school. Um, And the church was embodied in so much scandal. But from that, even from darkness, where there's so much scandal with the church, came so much light. There's so many, it was um, so many of my, my closest relationships. I graduated with, get this, like eight people. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) In my class. It was a very small graduating class. And, um, man, they're my family. They are my family. And so that move, it's amazing how one move, one decision you can make can impact the rest of your entire life. My kids Mm -hmm. came from that mustard seed that she planted going there and moving down on faith. Um, and I, 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 I know I'm kind of all over the place. I'm sorry, but, um, no, this is good. It it really, that just kind of, my mom was a big, big piece of me becoming who I am today. She was uncomfortable um, growing up because she only was exposed to black people. So when she grew up and had to start working, um, she got a job and she worked with white people. And she didn't know how to act. She felt like she, you know... Um, she was inferior. And mm-hmm. she said, I, I never want my kids to feel like this. I, that I have to expose them to other races before 
you know, the real world basically before you get into an, like a time where you're working with them and you can speak confidently, you know, alongside them. And they don't say, wow, you talk good for a black person. <laughs> you wow. know, that type situation where she used to hear that. So when she brought us down to Atlanta, she saw that as like, I got to give my kids a better life. And she did. I was part of a program, my brother and I, she put us in a lottery where they used to ship. The program was called M to M, uh, Minority to Majority. I think that was what it was called, meaning that you take uh, minorities to a majority white population school and you like basically infiltrate that population. Gotcha. You know, it's that, the segregation thing that was going on then. And mm -hmm. man, white people were mad. <laughs> they really? were so mad. They were up in arms. This is in like the 80s and 90s. They were up in arms about that program in Georgia. They That's were fascinating to me because, you know, people act like uh, Atlanta's the promised land. You know, even back when I uh, went to college there, they were acting like Atlanta was the promised land. Black folks can do whatever here and everybody's happy and harmonious. Well, I think... It was, from the simple fact, I think when I was growing up, uh, Mayor Maynard Jackson was in office mm -hmm. at that time, and Andrew Young was really big mm -hmm. around that time, and so, but it was like we were coming into power, and so it was like that, and so the white people were up in arms, though, kind of like, what is happening, and that's what was what the white flight started, because we were in the, the city, and they started just coming, going further and further out, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that as a child, Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm so grateful because that exposure, my mom hit it right on the head, that when she put me in that system, I did not look at white people as superior to me. You know, I was not inferior. Mm -hmm. I sat right next to, to Brittany and, you know, yep. uh, Angie Sue on this side and <laughs> we played and we did whatever. And if she took my, my crayon, I'm going to yank it back and say, girl, do it again and we're going to have a problem. You know, it was just like <laughs> that. Won't start, not won't be nothing. Okay, right, and right. It was, it was a. I can look back now and see that, but just right. little. Um, it was it was tough though, cause I'm chocolate. I'm very I'm very chocolate. You know, melting your mouth, not in your hands. You and know. so, to be in that situation, um, it was it it was a lot growing up up then. Um, but I've come out now and I've used all of that and. I'm, I'm the happiest that I'm, I'm so grateful now. I really am. On my darkest day, I can still, I laugh at everything. God gives me so much material to laugh at, Michelle. Yeah, and it's just, probably a lot of yourself. I know I laugh at myself a lot. Oh, my God. It's hilarious. <laughs> and the circle, my tribe, the tribe of people that I have. It, you may not hear them, but I have uh, people down there. They're cracking up right now. Like, I'm just surrounded <laughs> by uh, just craziness. And I love it though. I love it. I love my family and I live a very charmed life, but it's, it hasn't always been this way. And so it makes me appreciate it a whole lot more and I can give to others and, and just inspire. So that's who I am. I'm an inspiration. I'm, I'm a light. I think it's awesome. And now I want to ask you, cause you said a couple of things about your mom mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting because we oftentimes don't understand what our parents do for us as kids until we ourselves have kids right we're making certain kinds of decisions when did you start realizing all of the you know that your mom was kind of a pioneer that she was doing something that was out of the norm for her circle and that she was kind of pushing herself out of her comfort zone to do better for you guys it's sad to say that I only have recently gained that, um, I guess, perspective of just really just taking a, a backseat and, oh, I'm getting emotional. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm sorry. We can slow it down. <laughs> no, it's fine. Just, um, I'm so grateful because I, I, I asked the question um, to myself, like, you know, so, so many things I don't understand, but why does she act the way that she acts? Because, you know, mothers, they can drive mm -hmm. us crazy sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I'm like, why is, is she like this sometimes? Or and it, you just think, well, she's the way she is because of whatever environment that she experienced growing up. 
And so then I had to think, well, what did she experience growing up? And I had to start to like kind of dissect what she went through. And she went through a lot. Like when I actually sit back and piece together everything that she went through, I'm like, oh my God, this woman is like bulletproof, you know, and <laughs> to come out, you know, and not be on drugs and have drinking issues and everything and just still, um, she still drive me crazy, Michelle. I'm not going to act like she don't. <laughs> <laughs> to do Jesus you know but uh it just the respect that I have for her and it really I went through like um some issues if just with with my older daughters within the past couple of years I went through like this huge custody battle um with their father and we kind of alluded to some of the things um previously uh when we were talking before about just the first marriage that I had and the difficulties that I had there and it just wasn't good. And so going through all that, you reflect on yourself as a parent. And I needed to, I leaned on my mother a lot. Mm-hmm. And she just kind of was open and had a conversation with me, which was kind of like, that's why I did the stuff that I did. Like you, I wasn't able to understand it then, but man, I can understand it now. And isn't it funny how the universe brings stuff around full circle yeah. when you just, whoo, those lessons that you learn. And it just, and so now I'm like, man, I, that not nobody talk about my mama. <laughs> that, not no, <laughs> that not nobody talk about my mama, Michelle. Okay, like that is Bay. That's my that's my boo. And so, um, yeah. yeah, she's been through a lot, and she deserves to be celebrated. Like, you know, I think a lot of people though. We hear this whole Me Too movement, everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, and so it seems like at that time. It just, I don't know if it's just me, but men were just wilding out. And so, <laughs> it, was, it was just crazy. Men, I think? <laughs> men, I think, I think it's really interesting because I think that, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm not going to say mm-hmm. how many years. You know the math. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm a little bit older than you. So, I tend to like more old-fashioned men in some ways, despite their flaws, right? right? Because I find that a lot of the younger guys have similar flaws, but they manifest differently in ways that I don't, I, I don't like or understand. So I do not believe that boys will be boys. I don't care when you came on this earth. Uh, Mm -hmm. there's no such thing as boys will be boys. If I ever caught my son doing half the things that I hear that some of these other boys do or have done, or even, well, we don't even get into our current president or his Supreme Court nominee. Oh, my goodness gracious. um, I can assure you that I would beat my son to within an inch of his life. Absolutely. That that he did stuff like that. And so... I, I don't believe in that at all, but I do, <laughs> I do have a certain appreciation for a little bit more of an old fashioned. You know, I do maybe, too. <laughs> maybe manly, manliness is not as much in style now. You know, I, I can't take a metrosexual man. I can't take it. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness gracious. I could not agree more. You know, I love him um, a little bit older. You give me the salt and pepper. Yes. Oh. And so uh, my girlfriends make fun of me. My ex-husband makes, everyone makes fun of me about like, oh, do you guys get a discount with his AARP card? Uh-uh. First off, first off, <laughs> leave, me and, leave me him and his pension alone, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing A-OK. <laughs> we just fine around here. <laughs> okay, we're just fine around here with our AARP discount. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I love me some seasoned men. So uh, yeah, it's it's a little crazy, but I wanted to give you that that detail. My my mom is amazing, and and that's the man. And she's living her best life. She she's the one that got her a little younger man. My well, my boyfriend is is older than my mama boyfriend. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> see, your mom and I are on the same page then, because <laughs> oh, really? I like I like old fashioned. I don't like old men. <laughs> you sound just like her. You sound just like her, the baby. <laughs> oh, she she got New Orleans on that one. Oh, baby. Oh, oh baby. Yes. She, so she is out here living her best life. If you heard me, I said, you know what? 
That is I'm beautiful. I'm so excited for her. I really, I'm, I'm excited for her. Like I said, knowing where she's come from and she's just enjoying life and her boyfriend, you know, she says he has an old soul. Go for it, mama. Do yeah. it. You exactly. know, so I just want her to be happy and um, I'm, I just love it. I, I love it. I love That's it. That's awesome. Well, how did, how did her decisions shape you then specifically? Like, so she decided to get up and leave Chicago when everybody was telling her she's nuts, where are you taking them babies? How you going to live? You got a job. You got this, that, you know, I know it because I've heard it. Been there. Too. Absolutely. <laughs> where are you going? I'm yeah. going, I'm going to Atlanta. Oh, okay. Uh, you got but you don't know nobody. <laughs> I'll get a job when I get there. Where are you going to live? I don't know. I'll find some place when I get there. Because that's how, you know, that they was. They go on there over there and talk some sense into Michelle. She's talking crazy. Right. <laughs> she's talking crazy. But how did that shape you as, as a young girl seeing that? Now, at the time, you didn't, you weren't cognizant of necessarily of all that. But I know you heard somebody saying, your mama crazy. You heard um, me say it. I heard it, but I wasn't cognizant of it. It, but what I can see shaping me now is that I, I don't get attached. I'm not I'm not afraid to jump up and move. Mm-hmm. And um and you know so so many people just have these little anchors. It's like oh okay I can pick up and take my kids. Oh I want to move to Spain. That I'm not even scared. Uh, and so there's no fear when it comes to that. It's like um I think she lives by the rule of thumb that I'm not the first person to do it. And I damn sure won't be the last. So there must there be a go. way. There you go. And that has shaped my life. Really, it has. So. Well, yeah. Parenting. Business Career changes. Yes. Career <laughs> changes. Businesses. <laughs> business failings. Business successes. It's just like, okay, cool. You know, I, I, I do a joke. Okay, we're going. We're approaching a, a cliff. Sharp rocks at the bottom. Okay, bring it on. Like, you know, we're going to figure it out. Together. Right. Um, we'll figure it out on the way down. You know, we will figure it out on the way down. And you know what? And when it's my time to check out, it's like, man, I had a wild ride. Like, I'm, I'm not even, I'm just not worried. And I, I think that's what I've seen happen with her. Like, just the universe and God, it just always has me. And not in, like, a naive um, sort of just I'm not being responsible type way. It's just like, no, we, we're, we're always good. I'm right. always going to be good. I never need anybody to worry about me. I got it. I'm going to be good. And so it's like a hope that I always carry with me. Or a confidence. Yeah, a confidence. Um, but you, I say hope because so many people are just, like, I, I, I have a, a woman's group. And one of the young ladies was in mental depression and, um, mm-hmm. and mental, you know, things are, that's very serious to me. I've gone, oh, we can go down a whole different path with that. And But I can hear, you know, some of the people talk about, like, what they have going on with their kids and I'm like it just seems like so many people are in despair and there's a lack of hope and hope meaning like they can't see a better way out of this like they can't see right. that it's just always going to be dark and for me even in my darkest time when I was going through a custody battle with my kids you know or when my husband came out and told me he was gay and he was leaving me you know mm-hmm. it's like I'm crying in a fetal position and I'm still having to work and doing stuff but I feel like literally just put a um, put a box over me, just you know, and it's dark. But just stick a pencil in it and just poke one little hole in it, and right. I felt like that's. I always had a little bit of light. Right. It was all dark, but it was a little bit of light, and that was the hope that, okay, just put one step in front of the other, just one foot at a time, and you'll get out of it. And so that's what I mean by hope. It's a confidence, but it's just a hope to just. I know it's gonna be okay. Like right. so. Well, my saying is, it's going to be all right because it's got to be all right. It got to be. We ain't got, we ain't got no options around we here. We got no other choice around here. It's going to be all right because it's got to be all right. Either it's going to be all right or it's going to be all right. <laughs> it's going to be all right all right. So, yeah. Well, you know, since you, you opened the door, I am going to ask you about, I have to ask, I I've had plenty of breakups. So far, I haven't had one come at me and say he was gay and he was leaving me. Mm-hmm. That must have messed your head up. Yeah, that was um, that was definitely 
a lot. Um, excuse me. I think for me, and I can talk about it now because back in the day I was, oh, I would just bawl anytime I even thought about it. Um, but you know what? That had to be the best thing to happen to me. That would be the best thing. Oh, really? I'm, I'm so grateful for that, Michelle. Because the Kindle that I am right now, I would not be, oh, women, we do this so often where mm-hmm. we shrink ourselves to make sure that the guys that we with are comfortable, you right. know? So I dim my light, you know, and um, as not to outshine you. Cause I want, you know, I want you to feel like you the man or I mean, this, that, you know, I'm always like, yeah, you know, look, but I know I'm great, but look what this person is doing. And, um, and I, and I'm trying to build you up, but at the same time, it's like, it's taxing on me because I'm putting this energy. I need somebody where they stride matching my stride. And God knew I, I actually prayed one time. I was just like, you know, um, cause I wasn't going to leave. I'm mm-hmm. like, if it's for me, let it be for me. If it's not remove it from me, that's mm-hmm. always like a prayer. And the universe works magic, man. Just stuff will start going into place and you don't even know, but you better be ready. Oh when yeah. It does. And so I was Careful ready. what you ask for, you, <laughs> you will surely get it. Girl. So when that happened, we had just come back from a trip, um, a business trip, and we were making all these plans. I had just, you know, got my promotion. I was so excited. I was so excited. Um, plans about the future, what we were going to do. And we are just in- intimate like two days prior. Um, and we had a big argument one, uh, one day because he, he didn't come home the night before and, uh, which wasn't like him, you know, and it was just unacceptable. He had called me, but he was like, I'm too drunk to drive. And I just feel like as an adult, I'm like, Mm-mm, take an Uber, like leave your car right. wherever it is and come home. He's like, I can't do that. I'll just, spend. and once he said, Oh, you just want to spend a night. Oh, that's what we're doing. Okay. But that was a whole situation. Wow. And so that next day we had a big fight. But it wasn't like, we didn't, we really, he and I didn't really fight. Um, I've known him all my life. He is amazing. He is amazing now. He's, uh, uh, even throughout all this that we've gone through, he's been amazing. He's an amazing dad. Uh, Still a very good friend of mine. Um, And he's family to me. Uh, But roles shift. (laughs) So he, um, we had an argument, but I didn't think it was that bad. He, I thought he left and slammed the door and I knew I had some work to do or whatever like that. We were yelling when he came home. And so I went to tell everybody bye or something like that um, or leave the house, but I saw his car was still there. So I went to talk to him and, you know, look around the house. I didn't see him. He was in my daughter's room in the closet. No pun intended. He came out of the closet when he was in the closet. Anyway, (laughs) and that's what he, you know, he was like, uh, he just wanted to talk to me and I hope I'm not, you know, given too much, but he, he wanted to talk to me and he just, uh, he was like, I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, do what? You know? And I'm like, babe, we just had like a little fight. What you talking about? You know? And he's like, I'm living a lie. And then that's when he said, you know, I'm gay. And I was like, whoa. And so my, my mind literally went to protect, uh, to protective mode. I was in shock. I told him, Hey, like, hold that thought. I got to go do this appointment. And when I come back home, we'll talk about it. And I went out the house I drove I literally was just I don't even know how I got to my destination I I did everything on autopilot I closed business (laughs) I did whatever I need to I back I got back home and I proceeded to be on autopilot for about the next two months like I just you know and then finally we had a conversation and I was like you can't leave me like this like not I'm like I'm not expecting us to be together but from a financial standpoint I was going to be crippled I had just left my office and signed up for a new lease on another office right um, where I le- the office that I had left before was a co-op so you know you're splitting the bills you're splitting right. the responsibility this office was all me I had people depending on me and I'm like you can't leave me like this this was supposed to be the highlight of my life and um, it was one of the darkest hours and I he said I said you can't do this this isn't fair you know, you can't do this to me. And he said, um, I have to do this. It wouldn't be fair to his partner that he was with, that he was leaving me for. And girl, mm-hmm. I saw myself, I, I kid you not, in that moment, I saw, I had a split decision. I, and I, I, I 
say this because we don't we see shows like snap and stuff uh-huh. and and we say how can that like that's crazy how can a person do that you could do that someone can as calm as i was when he said that to me i saw myself like standing over his body uh-huh. like i stuck yeah and so i had to have a moment because I was like, "Ooh, I'm about to, I'm about to lose my whole life." <laughs> right. I like my whole life flashed before my eyes because I saw myself doing something and totally crazy. And um, I went and spoke with a mentor of mine, and that's when I had to make the snap decision. Like, all right, it's just you, baby girl. So you got to do it, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And so, lost the house lost the kids for a while I had to just go reinvent myself and just kind of figure out who I was because you know I don't know if we spoke about this but about my first marriage happened when I was 18 and so he was my second and I just thought we were going to be together forever that just it just stunned me and yeah it just stunned me so it was just crazy so I had to figure all of that out in a very short period of time <laughs> so that was that but then you took all of that, went on that journey of self-discovery, reinvented yourself, and became this powerful, amazing, gorgeous businesswoman. Thank you. <laughs> what well, how did how did that how did that turn about? How did that happen? Because obviously you go through a period like that, you go through something like that, and there's a period of, I don't know about for you, but I know for me, I kind of cocoon (laughs) for a while. I think I'm just emerging from said cocoon. (laughs) Like, literally, I just poked, like, one little, you know, glitterified, uh, got all the glitter on this wing (laughs) out out of the cocoon a little bit. So I'm, I'm still in it you know, um, a little bit because your life completely changes. Your circles change. Mm -hmm. You know how embarrassing that is? Oh yeah. Like I don't, it's, it's, it's on a whole nother level. (laughs) It's, it's, um, especially I think for us, um, it was really shocking because we, we were that couple. Like we didn't really fight. We look great together. You know, for all intents and purposes, like we were kind of like I don't know if you watch Blackish. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we were like. Uh, you were Bo. Yeah. You were Bo yeah, and absolutely. Dre. <laughs> Bo and Dre. Yes, Rainbow and Dre all day long, and have fun. The kids, you know. Um, and so, that was us. And so when it happened, it just kind of like. I I don't know. People probably weren't actually talking about me, Michelle, but I felt like. Just yeah. in my head, you know, because people really don't care about it. Yeah. It's true. It <laughs> and, takes a while and, to realize that, but it's, it's true. Uh, they really care. don't. They, they, they don't. But in my head, I just hear, you know, the whispers like, do you know what? Oh, my God. Did you hear what happened? Did you hear that? You know, he, girl, he left her for a man. And, you know, it's, and right. I'm just like, and in my small circle, you know, the community I told you I grew up in, you know, mm-hmm. everybody know everybody. And my kids, you know, we had our whole lives on Facebook. And it was just, like, devastating. Everybody in my business is such a small, you know, tight-knit community in my business. So I did have to cocoon. And you have a tribe of people around you that just, I don't know, they just, you know, wrap you up. And it's, it's, it's I feel like they're still hugging me. <laughs> like, you know, so I have, I have a great, great, great group of people around me. I'm so blessed, you know, so blessed. Well, but I guess for me, you know, when you go through a bad breakup like that, regardless of the cause, right, regardless of what the particular issue is, for me, the issue is always trusting my judgment again. Like, how right. did I misjudge this person? How did I misjudge this situation so badly? You know what mm, I mean? Absolutely. absolutely. Is that part of what kind of, I mean, and I'm asking because, that seemed like that would be the part that would devastate me the most, but it might it, just be my thinking. Like, You know what? For me, it validated my judgment. It validated the fact that, girl, your gut is, like, insane because um, I asked him years beforehand about his sexuality. Oh. You know, 
yeah, I did. And he denied it. And so, um, and of course, people tell you when they're ready. So it's not to be, like, I'm not right, saying anything course. other than the fact that I felt it, but mm-hmm. he wasn't ready. And so, um, but it's still, when he came out and said it to me, I usually use the example of when you see someone dying of cancer and you know they're going to pass away. Mm-hmm. But when they actually die, it still hurts. <laughs> you know, right. it's still kind of like you're in the shock. And so when he came out, I was like, but wait, <laughs> like you weren't supposed to actually come out. What's happening? You know, and the timing of it, is there ever going to be an appropriate time for your husband to come out and say, okay, no. No, no, probably <laughs> not. For a man, no. But that time was really crappy. Right. So, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think for me, it was the other way around that, um, cause I had started seeing a therapist and, um, she was telling me that you got to go with your gut, like that, mm-hmm. that small, still voice inside of you. And do you know, sometimes I still question that voice, but that voice is not steering me wrong. You and know, that, every mistake I've ever made in my life has been when I've ignored that voice. Girl, you better preach. Every single time. Yep. Why we do that? But I mean, the lessons you get from it, but God, you kind of wonder if I just would have listened. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I've, I have um, come to believe that we've been taught, particularly in Western society and in U.S. culture in particular, that that voice is your imagination as opposed to it being a tool to help you navigate life. Right relatively unscathed because you nobody's can get through life completely unscathed but you know that it's it's there to help you and guide you and when I started I mean I remember when I was very young I would just know stuff sometimes I just Mm. I didn't know why I knew it didn't know how I knew it and as I got older nobody told me otherwise you know in, in my house, nobody told me otherwise. So I just kind of, okay, I, I know who's on the phone before the phone rings, or I know, you know, right. like that. When I got older, I started seeing the pattern though. And I think it's just tapping into that, somehow tapping into that. But our society, especially if you spend a lot of time, I think especially if you spend a lot of time in the church, thankfully, <laughs> like mm-hmm. I was saying, thankfully, thankfully um, you know, I mean, I went to Catholic school mm. for eight years, nine years, went to Catholic school up through my first year of high school, went to church, you know, pretty much. Michelle, it is so amazing how our lives are so parallel. That is just yeah. amazing to me. Mm-hmm. You're like my little sister. Seriously, I love it. I'm like, okay, cool, we got to <laughs> keep doing this. Maybe not on air, but we definitely can keep doing it. We're definitely going to keep doing this. But I think we have another one, at least one more we need to do on air. But I say all this to say that I think if I had tuned in more to all that church stuff, if I had taken it more on board personally, I think I would have suppressed a lot more Mm. of of that instinct, you know, that voice. I think because I think sometimes there's just that tendency for people to tell you you're not right or, you know, or for society or. And I, I say church just because that's the only place where I think I got that, really. I didn't really get it amongst my people. But, you know, where they right. kind of play you like, nah, you're just a little nutty. Nah, there ain't nobody talking to you. A little nutty. Yeah, that's not, that's not, God's not talking to you, you know. No, it totally is. It totally, it to- totally is. And uh, I think for me, I I look for ways to rationalize, like, nah, that that can't be and so you like go against it so yeah and I don't know they say when you're looking for something you find it so I I but I have to get better at that like still to this day I I second guess myself um a lot in business with some of my teammates and it's like gosh I feel like God keeps Kindle like you're good I got you <laughs> like just listen to yourself like trust it you know trust that voice I feel like women would probably do that we do that a lot yeah, a lot. I think yeah. so. And especially, let me ask you about that in business, though, because that's really important. As a business person, you're trying to make your moves. You're trying to, you know, grow your business. You're trying to um, hone your message. You're trying to um, train your people, lift them up so that they can accomplish what they want to accomplish. You've got all these different moving parts. 
how does that intuition, how does that, that voice help you as a business person? It is so, it's so, so vital. Um, because it, I have, you know, I hire, um, I hire people, I run a brokerage. And so um, I hire different agents and things of that nature. And I think it's that intuition, which my mom taught me that intuition, you know, it may seem like hocus pocus or something, but it comes from um, that subconscious part of you that just takes in information from not only this life, I mean, the brain is always working while you sleep, right. while just it's always taking in information. So mm-hmm. it's from other stories you may have heard, other situations, always looking for danger, past lives we lived, and she's just always like, so be, you know, just be aware. And uh, when you meet people, it, you just kind of feel a tingle sometimes. You're like, mm, just don't feel right. Yeah. And so you just, you just, I'm more alert. Mm, that don't sound right. And I, I used to try to force things to go my way a lot. And now I think I've gotten more calm about things. And, you know, not to say I won't get upset sometimes and just kind of have a fit, hissy fit, you know, like, gosh, it made sense. Why didn't they, you know, do business with me at X, Y, and Z. But it's so funny how you can't connect the dots forward, but you can totally connect them backwards, you know, (laughs) and you see like, oh, that's why, because this person had, you know, X, Y, and Z going on. And that would have been a bad book of business for me, you know, like, and so it's like, oh, you appreciate, like, I'm glad it worked out that way. I'm glad I went with my gut and I didn't go move forward with this person because they end up being like a certified criminal or something crazy like that, you know, and so, um that's how my intuition helps me. It, it literally is, it's just a little, mm, that didn't feel right. When that person said that, that, it, mm, and I don't know what file <laughs> that is, you know, being pulled in my brain that's saying, mm, honey, we need to investigate this. We'll have a seat. We're going to investigate what's going on here, but it is vital. I need tonight. I'm going to pray for more of that actually, that awareness. Cause it's, it's uh, it's huge. On discernment, as they say. That's the word. Look at the you, spirit of this. discernment. That is that spirit of the, my, I have a praying mom. Let me tell you, she's Buddhist now. Oh, really? But, <laughs> yeah, she uh, she uh, went ahead and converted um, to being a Buddhist, even though I still feel like she's heavily Christian. I think like she did this year. But uh, she still prays and she chants for me, but she's always done that. And I'm a big believer of how you grow up. You That's how your normal is shaped. Yeah. So growing up in a household where my mom prayed for me every morning before we went to school, mm-hmm. that we had favor with us as we came and as we, we, you know, coming and going, you know, that God uh, sheltered us and, you know, just, uh, she just used to cover us. I, I just love that. I thought that everybody's mom prayed for them like that, Michelle. I really did. I thought that, you know, and I found out we, um, we ended up being homeless a couple of times. Uh, when I was growing up, my adolescence, when I was in high school. Wow. And I, I had to live with different friends and stuff. And that it was a huge lesson to me to see how different people were. And that's a big deal, like how I parented my children, because I do realize that the people that you see walking around today are only an example, or they are literally, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? They're just a product of what their normal is. If you have one parent that's an alcoholic and the other, you know, who's really aggressive and the other parent hides and is passive aggressive and they make this kid and that's what they get in this household. That kid is like a nuclear bomb situation waiting to happen, like walking around mm. on this planet. And that's your coworker 10 years later, you know, right. and you don't know what's going on with them. And that's multiplied that on such a bigger scale. And I'm just like, Oh, we're all walking around with just these different mixtures of everything. And I only got that when, I dealt with my mom, you know, raising me and going out and experiencing how my other friends were living. I'm like, oh, your mama don't pray for you in the morning. <laughs> you know? and I'm like, oh, oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, your dad actually live in the house and don't like be drinking all the time. And so it was just it was different for me growing up to see that, right. you know. So, yeah, that was a big lesson for me. Well, you know, and that's something I used to say. It's like the only reason that I didn't have more problems than what I had growing up is because my rock bottom was higher than some other people's rock bottom. Mm. Mm, That's a good one. 
you know, because, I mean, you can grow up right next door to somebody and be in the same basic place socioeconomically or whatever, but whatever's going on in that house changes things. Absolutely. And the gene, the gene pool, like, you know, um, the, like, that's a big deal too. Just what well, I'm not, I'm not going to argue gene pool just because I don't know enough about it. That's what oh. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to stay out of that from that perspective because I think that's a dangerous and slippery slope and it's something that's been used against us in oh. ways. Yeah, so I guess. I, I tend think. to be a little, I tend to be a little wary of that in some ways. Although I do know that it plays, it definitely plays a role. Yeah, I think it plays a, a, a little bit. It may not be everything, but I definitely feel like um, that co- it's just a combination. Oh, yeah. But nurture, there's, and the reason I say I know that it plays a role because I can even see it like the difference from my girls to my son. Just there's certain things that I inherently thought because I didn't grow up with brothers. Oh, well, kids are kids, you know, boys, mm-hmm. girls, they're, they're kids are kids. And I had the girls and things were a certain kind of way. And then when I had my son, I was like, oh, that's a different creature. He was mm-hmm. thinking differently and doing different stuff. And I don't know why, because I'm the same. And it's just us here. So I don't understand. But there are some things that I know definitely are nature versus nurture. Absolutely. But I also, I, I really do fundamentally believe that whatever your basis is, if, you're, if your basis is like your mom did her level best to make sure that your rock bottom was going to be higher than the rock bottom she knew. Right. And that, did. I think that makes a huge difference in like the accomplishments that you've been able to make and the things you've been able to do for your kids because you want their rock bottom to be higher than yours, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You know, I think it's admirable that your mom got up and left. That's the main thing because I think that's the thing that women are are – less inclined to do sometimes yeah I think that was um she got up and left Chicago um and she got up and left my dad and I I love my dad you know that was my dad was my boo you know but um he was he was a great dad he was a shitty husband (laughs) so that that it is what it is I don't think I could really understand that as a kid because you really can't separate the two but um yeah, and that's a that's a that's a big deal. So many people stay in it, you know, for the kids. And uh, I don't think I gave her credit for leaving. Like I said, I'm older; I can see it differently now. Right, right. You know, and so I appreciate it a whole lot more. Yeah, uh, it's 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 challenging because especially when she left. I remember even when when I got divorced, and it wasn't quite that long ago. I imagine. Um, When you get divorced, divorced women are perceived in a very particular way. It was very interesting. So, like, I had gone back to New Orleans, and, yeah, at first I was with my husband. Everything was cool, connected with old girlfriends from high school and stuff like that. And our kids were playing with their kids. And then as soon as our relationship blew up, none of those women wanted to have me around. That is so interesting. You know, I I heard um, another young lady say that in our women's group. I'm like, do I just, I don't think maybe I hung around a lot of, or maybe I could cone myself off so bad (laughs) that I didn't even realize. Well, and of course in Atlanta that didn't matter because I didn't have a a set of girlfriends that I was running with, you know, but these were people I knew from elementary school and high school, you know, that I reconnected with when I went back home. But it was just, it was really interesting to me. And Why do you think that is? I think there's a perception that if you get divorced and you want somebody else's man, and I'm like, no, I just got rid of a chucklehead. Why would I want yours? And first of all, that's the first thing. I just got rid of my chucklehead. Why would I want yours? But second of all, you do know that I knew that dude back in high school. He right. shit. <laughs> right. Thank, Pardon thank my you. French. Y'all. <laughs> I might thank have to. You. I might have to beep that out or something. I don't know if I, this will count I as family I, friendly. Yeah, I think I said a naughty word too. I apologize. That's okay. That's apologize. okay because you know my mouth. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but you know I said but I think that's interesting because I feel like sometimes you know 
one of the challenges to women leaving is not just that they're leaving their own uh, situation. They're often going to be more financially um, in a more financially precarious situation, but also they lose their support system. Who, honey? Their friends, their families oftentimes look at things differently. And it may not be so much now. I mean, I'm looking at this from, you know, 20 years ago, roughly, right. or, you know, something to that effect. But I, I say that because that wasn't that long ago. That was the 90s when I got, right. you know, late 90s when I got divorced um, from my first marriage. We've been married 11 years. I think I got treated worse by my family and talked really? about worse by my family. Yes. Wow. Well, you know, you know, we'll talk about this another time, but, you know, I yeah. a white boy, and, you know. Oh, you like, yeah. Why are you leaving mm. that good white? Why is that good white boy? You know, now, white boy. now, that one, you need, yes. out. you need to be Look. working out with that good white boy. He got, the, he's the engineer. He got, he make good money. You what know. you doing? Somebody you told doing? me if he not beating on you. If right. If he not beating on you, what you doing? If he not beating on you, I'm doing? like, well, well, but the verbal abuse and the emotional abuse. Like, that's way worse. That's I'm way just worse. Like, I'm not going to have my kids grow up in this. But you know what? We have to specify the husbands because I've been married so many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have, the husband, we'll have the husband show. Yes. We'll have a husband show in a couple of months. Let's get through the holidays, have some nice family time, and then we'll come back in the new year. And we'll start, you know, because I think, no, I think there's a lot to unpack there, too, because you and I both have been in interracial relationships. Right. And. um, So many. (laughs) So many. Yeah. My my relationship, I think I had told you, like, I I wanted to actually, like, the podcast that I I, uh, wanted to start for myself at one point, it would dive into all of those things, uh, the different, because my just relationship with my second husband was very interesting and the first husband from the interracial dynamic and then just having the kids and the blended family. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and all of this, like I'm 36 tomorrow. So I feel like I've experienced so much in just such a like concentrated pocket of time. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Oh my God. And so this, let me tell you what this next 20 years need to look like, Michelle. <laughs> I'm like, I need to be on a yacht popping bottles, like just living, you know. Living your a, best life. Yes. Where's the string, <laughs> this string bikini that I just need to be in with a, an endless amount of, uh, like, just mimosas and cocktails <laughs> and reading. I like to read. So let, give me some books or something like that. So, Yeah. That's that because I've I lived enough. I've had enough of the darkness. Let me just be light. So well, I think that all of the work that you're doing, because you're also creating entrepreneurs. Absolutely. You're not just you're not just being an entrepreneur. You're helping to create new entrepreneurs. All of that light that you're bringing to other people is just going to bless you more and more and more. And then we'll be on the yacht together. Absolutely. All right? Private oh chef gosh. and uh, personal personal trainers and I you love know. it. Now I, love I, it. I know you like the the silver foxes, but you know I I prefer mine a little younger. But we'll you, we'll make it work. You can keep your you can keep your young you can keep your young man. I have a very a very old man with me right now, and I enjoy him. Awesome. <laughs> yes, he's the best. So I love it. That's awesome. (laughs) Very cool. Well, Kendall, tell me what you got going on and where people can connect with you. Well, on Instagram, I guess they can follow me. Uh, I just upgraded my name. I used to be Million Dollar Kendall, but uh, I am now Billion Dollar Kendall. (laughs) Yes, so that's that's my current platform. I'm really not social media savvy like I need to be. That basically has uh, family, business, fun, but I need to do this branding thing that everybody is doing. And then maybe I could start marketing like some, uh, flat tummy tea. (laughs) 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 Do it like reviews and makeup tutorials. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, we're gonna get that. We're gonna get your podcast off the ground first. Absolutely. You know that was. I was so excited when you told me about that project that you wanted to start. What, I know it will be almost. great. Yes, and let me tell you all the life that has happened, girl. It's been coming, but I love it. Like I see, I'm just. I'm having a great time. I, I'm having a great time. So I can't even complain. But it's taken some time to get here. But that's part of the, it's just part of the journey. And yeah. so can't make it out of this thing unscathed. And the journey so. is what it's all about. It really is. And I'm learning that as I um, approach, you know, 40, I'm getting a little bit closer. And as a mom, uh, you know, we, we pray for our children, like, God, just make sure my kids are okay, and I want them to be happy, and it's like, no, nah, I want them to live life exactly how they're supposed to live it. I want them to be productive, but I want them to get out of life exactly, you know, of course, I don't want them to be hurt, and things. Like but you got to go, you got to be hurt, and I just want to be here when they go through things and let them know that it's always going to be okay. You're not the first. You're not going to be the last. So there has to be a way like somebody did it before you. And that like, I don't even think I talked about like the teenage pregnancy and everything, you know, that I went through, but like, that's always what's got me through. I'm not the first to go through this crap. I'm definitely not going to be the last. So let me go ahead and figure this out. Well, Kendall, you and I are definitely going to have to do another show. So we can get in all the nitty gritty. Kendall, Absolutely. it has been a blast. Tell everybody again where they can connect with you. And you, we, we should mention that, you can help them with their financial situation. I can. I can help you with your financial situation. More and money, so, more money. Hello. Um, and so that's a big thing that I do is uh, teaching people how to make, save, and accumulate money. And so um, if you at me, Billion Dollar Kindle on Instagram, uh, feel free to check me out and, and slide in my DM and let's chat. I can help you. And I, my passion really um, is, uh, I, I would say single parents because that's the right thing to say, but I really want to focus on moms. That's that market that um, it just, it's close to my heart. So. Very good. Ladies, let's get our money together. And this episode, we were talking about, about relationships and intuition, all these various things. But remember, as women, we have to keep in mind, particularly if we are parents, that all of that makes us who we are. And it also all influences our financial decisions. So you want to get with somebody like Kendall, contact her, Billion Dollar Kendall on Instagram. Kendall Weaver, thank yeah. you for being on Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Garrard. Thank you so much, Michelle. You have, I love this podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you. Wish you all the success in the world. Thank you. Well, that's our show this week, guys. You can reach out to me online at urbanbookeditor.com or michellebarad.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram as Urban Book Editor. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send in some topics you'd like to discover on the show. Make sure you tune into the show on March 12th when my guest will be author Michael Kenneth Bell. You can find us twice a month on Fridays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern at the Somewhere in the Middle Podcast.com. And don't forget to tune in to Julia Black and Me live on Saturdays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 4.30 p.m. Eastern for the Shelter in Place hashtag Pandemic 2020 live stream at https colon slash slash rebrand.ly slash shelter in place live stream let's continue the conversation you guys be good stay mindful and remain prayerful peace and blessings y'all